okay, we're going to go ahead and apply what you have done with your key. And now I've got your key before me. I've printed off it, and I, 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 I would suggest others do the same. Take that slide that he has uh, that he has put up there. I'll take a uh, what you call it a screenshot of that slide, the troubleshooting key. And I have put little quick notes on it as you went through, so I can know what you mean are saying what you mean by each one of these categories, and then hold that in front of you now. As and we've asked Joe to come back, and I've asked Joe; he's right over here. Uh, though you can't see his face, you can see his emblem. Hi, hi there, Joe. You are there, right? Hi, Jay. Yep, I'm here. Yep. Okay, and you're going to show this how to use this key. So let's, I'm going to give you right at the top of my head, let's use one that would be really easy, probably that'll get us into it. And this is the whole person of who God is. Let's chapter, let's go to chapter one, one, two, chapter one, 12 of the Quran. Uh, if you could uh, unpack that for us and we'll follow down through the key and try to apply it to that category as a model so that others can use it. All right, then I'm going to share the, so that one, one, two is the verse, which is thrown at you. Um, I've, Listen to the verse. The first step after that, step two, is to open up the word-for-word -word, um, Arabic um, resource, which you've got to use. If you don't use the word-for-word -word resource, then you're not going to get anywhere. So let's go to the word-for-word. -word. I'm using corpusquran.com. Can you see that on the screen now? Yep, I can see it. Okay. What are the allegations? Okay. That we've what is the allegation? Yeah. Well, okay. I can see a number of allegations here. Uh, one is that God is one, and that's attacking the idea that we believe that the Christians believe He is more than one. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, also, that that uh, let me just open it up so I have it. That uh, He does not beget it, nor is He begotten. So that's attacking His sonship. There's another. Let's attack. start with. Let's start with those two before. So the first thing is right in front of us. There it says God is one, and uh, the step two. For this particular verse, because this is verse one, um, say he is Allah, the one. So the first rule we have to do is change the word Allah into the father. Um, all right, then. So if we change this into the father, does it still work? Say he is the father, the one. Ah, yes, that reminds us of the creed, doesn't it? We believe in one God, the father. The father is the one God. OK, so that's fine. Here's the Nicene Creed in front of us there. We have to use the Nicene Creed because... Um, we can't use the, the First Council of Constantinople in 381. We have to use the First Council of Nicaea in 325 because that's the creed which is used in the, say, for the, the Armenian Apostolic Church or the, the Monophysite Church, or the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Eritrean Church, the Coptic Church. So the, that, that Christology works best. So we're going to use their Nicene Creed. And it says that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. So that's the first, the first, um, the first uh, creed is that the Father is one. And so here we have no problem. Yep, he is the father, the one. No problem. So people understand um, that this is. Re you're assuming, therefore, that this th these are pre these are Nicene Creed Christians who are writing this. Yes. So what I did is I started uh, to to get back to this Nicene Council. I didn't start and decide. Okay, let's start with Nicene. I just said, look, we're in the seventh century. Let's start with the councils. What's the difference? Can we find reconciliation between these texts? and uh, say, for example, the Sixth Ecumenical Council. So starting with the obvious and a well-known proximity of Islam and Christianity to, to, to Mishnaic Judaism, my method was to identify at which point uh, the Roman Ecumenical Christianity ceased to be compatible with the Hebrew messianism, messianism described in the Umayyad texts. So starting in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, I began to check like a jigsaw puzzle pieces, turning things around in different directions to see if I could fit anything together between the Roman Ecumenical Roman ecumenical Christianity and what was in the Umayyad texts, trying hard to keep my mind free from any Abbasid interpretations of those texts. Then I found, um, if I found irreconcilable discrepancies, I went back to the previous ecumenical council and so on and so on until I found no more contradictions between the two systems based on the literal texts. So this allowed me to see at which point Roman ecumenical Christianity diverged from the Hebrew messianism described in the Umayyad texts. And with this method, I managed to get back to the Nicene Bible and the Apostolic Ni and Nicene Creed, where I found there were no more contradictions. So it wasn't just that I decided on the Nicene Creed. I, I actually had to spend years and years turning things around until I found that there were no more contradictions. And that, that, that stopped at the Nicene Creed. Now, it, it could go back further, as Thomas Alexander has tried to, to explain that it goes back before the Nicene Creed. 
But you have to understand that after doing it for years and years with every single ecumenical council, looking at all sorts of verses, by the time I found something which matched, I stopped and said, that's it. <laughs> I'm not going to go any back any further. I don't see a need to go back further. It fits with the Nicene Creed. So I'll just stop at the Nicene Creed. So maybe it goes back further. But for me, it was enough that I had got, to, I, I had got a match at that point. So I stopped to that point. All right, so you're going to show from the Nicene Creed the, the parallels yeah. between what we see here and what we see in the text. Let's go ahead and look yeah. at those parallels. All right, then. So let's get back to sharing that screen then. Yep. So the first parallel there is we believe in one God, the Father. This is the first article of the Nicene Creed. And essentially what we have in uh, the first line of this Surah 112 is um, he is the Father, the One. Allah, the Father, Tom Theon. So um, this is uh, the God. It's also corresponding in Greek. It corresponds to Tom Theon, the God, which is God, the father. Um, um, and we also have um, a Hebrew name for, for God, which we talked about last time. Uh, El where El Allah. El yes, exactly. Um, so that's um, the same as God, most high, the father. So we have, we, we have to just see, does it correspond every time? So we're going to assume that, Allah here means the Father, God the Father. And we have one correspondence already. Yes, the Father is one. That's one God from the creed. All right, let's have a look at the next line. Does it con is it consistent? Does it continue? Um, so um, the Father is eternal, the absolute, maker of heaven and earth, the eternal. Okay, not a problem there. We don't have a problem with saying the Father is eternal, I, I, I suppose. Does anybody have a problem with saying the Father is eternal? Not okay. so far, so good. And then it says... Lam yalid wa lam yulid. He begets not, and nor was he begotten. Not he begets, and not he is begotten. So um, we'll you'll say you'll think to yourself, well, there, there's the contradiction with the creed because it says in the creed, begotten of the father. So the father has to be begetting, right? Uh, but in the Nicene Creed, although um, he is uh, the begotten um, so, uh, son. Um, and is referred to as the begotten son. Um, it says it has a clause here, singularly generated, uh, of the father of the essence. And there's the word usias of the essence of the father. So it's actually got a, cl a clarification that when we say begotten of the father, we mean begotten. That is, it says here, that is of the essence of the father so it's like a clarifying that this actually means begotten of the essence of the father so the the father is not the one who does the act of begetting but it is the essence the usia the spirit which begets that and this is also comparable with the apostolic creed which is more common and of course older where it says that he is begotten of the holy spirit under the virgin mary so um that begetting of the holy spirit is reference to the usia the essence of the father so what we're having uh, a reference to here is that it's not the father that begets the, the child, it's the, the essence which begets the child. Also, um, we have that the, in, in the creed that the, the Holy Spirit, um, uh, it's actually in the ends of the uh, uh, Armenian Apostolic Creed, for example, it says that the Holy Spirit has spoken through the prophets. So we have um, this reference in our minds. Well, wait a second, remember the, the Psalm, it says, uh, this day I have begotten you, and it's the same Hebrew root. Um, but the, the voice speaking in the psalm is, of course, the Holy Spirit that speaks to the prophets. So, again, it's saying the Holy Spirit has begotten. So it's in keeping with the creeds, both creeds, Nicene Creed, Apostolic Creed, um, that the begetter is the Holy Spirit. And that the begotten of the Father is, beget is begotten by the Holy Spirit, begotten of the essence of the Father. So it's saying that the Father is not the one that does the begetting and not was the father begotten. Uh, that also is reminding us, it's a speaking out against, uh, if you look on our list, one of the lists, the things it tells us to check for is modalism. Which number is, is that? That's you five. Me? That's five. Number five. So we, what was number four? Number four is tripart Christology. Uh, there's no, no Christology in this first, so we can skip that and go to five. So five is about modalism. And we can see here that the modalists would say they have this, the modalists believe that the father was begotten. The father was born of Mary and uh, the father died on the cross. That's called patripassianism, patripassianism, that the father suffered on the cross. This is one of the things that the modalists were accused of. Uh, they believed that 
the father just transformed into the son, was born of Mary, died on the cross, got buried, and then rose again uh, on the third day, ascended to heaven, and, and then came back as the Holy Spirit. This is that God just transforms into whatever form he needs, as and when required, that God is actually in time. The father is part of time. So, the, so they're saying that father here is essentially, when they're saying he's eternal and absolute, they're saying he's outside of time, and the father is was not the son the father was not begotten of of uh, is not the one that, he's not the one that was begotten he's not the one that was born of mary so this is actually speaking out against modalism um and it's confirming that the, the father uh, is 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 outside of time the father is uh, not the son and that the son was begotten of the holy spirit according to their their view uh, which is in keeping with the Nicene Creed, because of the essence of the Father. So they're just emphasizing the essence of the Father being the one that begets. And then the last part, walam yakun lahu kufu an ahad, and there is nothing comparable to him. So um, the Father is basically in the Creed. Very little is said. He's one God. He's Almighty. He's the Maker of all things, visible and invisible, and that's all that they can say about him. There's, there's not much you can say about him with regards to the Son. There's a lot which is said about him. There's with regards to the Holy Spirit. There's a lot which is said about him. But the father is just like absolute outside of time. He was not born. He's not the one that did the begetting. It's the Holy Spirit that begotten. Did the son was begotten of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary or was begotten of the essence of the father in the Nicene Creed. So this is just reiterating the Nicene Creed in its um, 325 version, not in the, uh, the 381 version. And it's also emphasizing uh, speaking out against specifically modalism here nothing no other type of christian is is being attacked in this verse here so okay so what you have done here is you've just uh, uh, taken the chapter 112 and you applied you start with the first category which is what are the allegations the allegations is that uh that god is one and he does not beget nor is he begotten uh, then you've gone through and you've opened up number two. You've gone to step number two, which is let's open up a word-for-word uh, -word source. In your case, you're using corpus.quran.com. And you've looked at the words in that categories. And then you've asked this simple question. Now, which is, it, which is, the, cat, which is the, um, uh, the, the sectarian group that it's, that it's, it's attacking? And yeah. in this case, it's number five, modalism. Yeah. So there's your application. This is a conference. This is an attack against modalism. And that's why it is there in what we know as the Umayyad Hadith. Bring yes. it back to what the Umayyad Hadith. How is that any different than what um, the, what has the, what have the Abbasids changed in it that you see has corrupted it? Well, it's really just take, removing the context. I think stopping uh, obviously, there's not a single verse in the Quran which refers to Allah as the Father. So, by deleting all references to God as the Father, they have. Um, uh, it's like, as we say, there's the no no reference to the word Trinity, Thaluth, no reference to the word Messihi, okay. Christian, no reference to the word Father. So, the Abbasids have obviously deleted and thrown out some verses which have removed the connection in our minds between. Uh, the one God, the Father, the Almighty, so th so that the one God is no longer connected in our minds with that first line in the Trinity when we're reading the Quran, because they've also packaged it. They don't come along and say here, well, in my case, I was actually quite lucky because uh, it was literally like here, <laughs> start looking at the Quran with, and nobody told me what it meant. So I actually was able to start coming up with my own ideas very quickly back in 1996. But most of the time, the, the Dawa teams are much more advanced these days. They come up to you and immediately say, God has no son. Here, here's the verse 112. See, he has no son. He doesn't beget. And they've already put into your head that God doesn't have any child. And so you're reading that not um, plainly, and you're not reading it in a historical 7th century context of this uh, area, which, you know, Arabia was called Herasium Ferax, the mother of all heresies. There were so many heresies coming out in Arabia. Uh, you're not putting yourself back in that time and saying, well, which heresy is this one speaking out against? Aha, this one's speaking out against modalism. You've already been told by the, the Dawa team which, what, that this is actually against all Christianity. So your mind has been preconditioned into a particular way of thinking without you being honestly able to work out what was being said by yourself. So this key is reversing the effects of that sort of 
a neurolinguistic programming or, 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 or almost like a hypnosis or, or language to persuade, you're kind of reversing that and you're reversing the, uh, the influences which have been put on the, the Abbasids, which is specifically, as they say in, in the Hadith, they say that two thirds of the Quran was deleted, is lost forever. Two thirds is lost. All you have left is one third of the Quran. So you're, you're starting to get an idea that, oh, I see. They've, they've taken out all the references to the fathers, so we don't have that. I'm actually going to just show you something else about that verse, which occurred to me when you were speaking just now. I'm going to have a look. The word begotten, yulad. So it says he begets not and uh, he and not is he begotten. When you click on this word yulad, it takes you into all sorts of different words, uh, which are, um, this is a very good resource to use, which are from that same root. Yes, here it is. Very interesting. Look at this Surah 90, verse 31. When you, when you were able to do this cross-referencing, cross-references is on my list, isn't it? What number is cross-references on, on my list? Uh, you're going to number 10. Okay, it's quite down, far down on the list, but it's a good chance to do it here. When you go to the cross-references, it takes you into the other verses, and you can see how these words are used in other, other verses. You'll see here in Surah 90... But it actually, um, you know, sometimes the Quran verses uh, opens with um, by, I don't know, you know, like, like it says, by, by the name of the Father, the Holy Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, like it but Bismillah rahman rahim They also say by the pen, by the ink pot, by, and here it is, by the begetter and that which is begotten. So it's actually swearing by the begetter and the begotten. And you can see that here. This is the word begetter. Can you see this? This is Surah 90, verse 3, 1. And it's uh, and Surah 90, verse 33, three, the begotten. Very, very interesting. Very nice. Because the third, you'll find this a lot in Quranic verses. That whoever wrote the, um, these uh, Umayyad texts thought very carefully about when he would mention the sun. And you'll see that when we see references to the sun, Walid, it's often the third word of a verse. And sometimes the third word of the third verse of a verse. So... Here we have the third word, the third verse, the third word, and it's the son, the begotten one, and the begetter. Well, we know that the, the father is not the begetter, but here the, the, the voice which narrates the Quran is swearing by the begetter and the begotten. So um, that should also sort of trigger you and start thinking, hold on a second, did the Abbasids forget something? Did they lose, miss something out? Sure, they removed references to the father. But did it leave references to the Son as the begotten and the references to the Holy Spirit as the begetter? Yes, they did. And here, Surah 90, verse uh, 3, uh, you'll see a reference to both the Holy Spirit and the Son as the begetter and the begotten there. It's a long conversation, but it's just a, a kind of a tantalizing t a sort of hint at what's later going to be coming as you, as you start to apply this, um, um, this uh, system. Okay, now... Just so people are aware, not everybody is going to agree with your interpretation of the Nicene Creed, probably of, of also the begetting and the begotten. Uh, that's fine. We're not here to sit there and try to quibble on whether or not you've got it correct. What we are looking at is asking, are these attacks against sectarian groups in that time period at that place? And yes. the whole soup that is there. And that's what we want to get back to. What and how is it that uh, whether or not even that those who wrote the Quran understood this or even understood the Nicene Creed correctly, we're not even a try to, we're not, we're not, that's not important because otherwise we're going to get caught up. I know yeah, people will look at this and they'll try, they'll yeah. get caught up on, we have an awful lot of heresy hunters in our group. Uh, that it's, it's okay. You know, is they, they can, it's not a problem to say, look, okay, what you're describing is still a heresy. Yes, it probably is still a heresy. And the heresy hunters are the ones who are going to be able to uh, identify exactly what heresy it is that's described. But, but what this, uh, and I'm not going to be the one who's going to be describing exactly what heresy it is. All I'm saying is, look, apply this uh, key and you'll start to see exactly consistently again and again, cross reference references to some kind of Christian belief, which was being promoted over other kinds of Christian belief at that time. And so the heresy hunters, you, you know, your job is to identify exactly which heresy is um, being promoted over the others. People have said it was um, Arianism, that it was anti-Trinitarian. And I'm showing here that actually we have references to the father, the begetter and the begotten in this text. And, and there are some really um, astounding things which you'll discover when you start looking into these cross references um, that uh, with regards to the, the word Walid, for example, the, which clearly are referring to the son 
uh, Jesus. So um, I just uh, want to remind people decide. that what we're doing, we're looking into a window of yeah. that time. We're looking into right. the environment, this, the uh, 7th century. We're looking to see what was the controversies of that time. Please don't think that Joe or I believe this or that we accept these heresies for ourselves. We don't, we may, and it's not even that we are saying that they've got it correct, that they have no. uh, interpreted the heresies correct. We're just saying, this is what we're now seeing. This is the window we're not looking at. Let's see, because that's where you need to see, understand how the Quran, that what eventually became the Quran, where are its antecedents? How did it come about? Who was the who were the people the main players at that time and what were the controversies? Yeah. Okay. I'm, good. I'm very good. If you disagree, say so. If you agree, say so. We'd love to hear your comments. Uh, that will now go to another example. We'll stop with one twelve and head on to another example. Uh, this is Jay, and as um, Joe says, uh, he's thousands of miles away. I don't even know where he lives, but I know he's way off to the east, not to my west. Goodbye, Joel. Until Goodbye. next time. Thank you. Over and out.